Good morning. All right, today we are going to read another couple chapters. We left at a spot that was kind of a cliffhanger. Um, Karana's ready to go to the Cave of the Wild Dogs. So we know that she's got her weapons. Her leg is in better shape. She's healthier. And they've been kind of hunting her. Um, so she's had, been, she's had to have been very careful. So chapter 15, here we go. Let me move this down a little bit. There had been wild dogs on the island of the Blue Dolphins as long as I remember. But after the Aleuts had slain most of the men of our tribe and their dogs had left to join the others, the pack became much bolder. It spent the nights running through the village and during the day was never far off. It was then that we made the plans to get rid of them, but the ship came and everyone left Galasset. I am sure that the pack grew bolder because of their leader, the one with the thick fur around his neck and the yellow eyes. I had never seen this dog before the Aleuts came, and no one else had, so he must have come with them and had been left behind when they sailed away. He was a much larger dog than any of ours, which besides, which besides have short hair and brown eyes. I was sure that he was an Aleut dog. Already I had killed four of the pack. But there were many left, more than in the beginning, for some of them had been born in the meantime. The young dogs were even wilder than the old ones. I first went to the hill near the cave when the pack was away and collected armloads of brush, which I placed near the mouth of their lair. Then I waited until the pack was in the cave. It went there early in the morning to sleep after it had spent the night prowling. I took with me the big bow and five arrows and two of the spears. I went quietly, circling around the mouth of the cave and came upon it from the side. There I left all of my weapons except one spear. I set fire to the brush and pushed it into the cave. If the wild dogs heard me, there was no sound from them. Nearby was a ledge of rock which I climbed, taking my weapons with me. The fire burned high. Some of the smoke trailed out over the hill, but much of it stayed in the cave. Soon the pack would have to leave. I did not hope to kill more than five of them because I only had that many arrows. But if the leader was one of the five, I would be satisfied. It might be wiser if I waited and saved all my arrows for him, but this I had decided to do. None of the dogs appeared before the fire died. Then three ran out and away. Seven more followed after a long time afterwards. Uh, and, sorry. Then three ran away. Seven more followed and a long time afterwards a like number. There were many more still left in the cave. The leader came next. Unlike the others, he did not run away. He jumped over the ashes and stood at the mouth of the cave, sniffing the air. I was so close to him that I could see his nose quivering, but he did not see me until I raised my bow. Fortunately, I did not frighten him. He stood facing me, his front legs spread as if he were ready to spring, his yellow eyes narrowed to slits. The arrow struck him in the chest. He turned away from me, took one step, and fell. I sent another arrow toward him, which went wide. At this time, three more dogs trotted out of the cave. I used the last of my arrows and killed two of them. Carrying both of the spears, I climbed down from the ledge and went through the brush to the place where the leader had fallen. He was not there. While I had been shooting at the other dogs, he had gone. He could not have gone far because of his wound, but though I looked everywhere, around the ledge where I had been standing and in front of the cave, I did not find him. I waited for a long time and then went inside the cave. It was deep, but I could see clearly. Far back in a corner was a half-eaten carcass of a fox. Beside it was a black dog with four gray pups. One of the pups came slowly toward me, a round ball of fur that I could have held in my hand. I wanted to hold it, but the mother leaped to her feet and barred her teeth. I raised my spear as I backed out of the cave, yet I did not use it. The wounded leader was not there. Night was coming and I left the cave, going along the foot of the hill that led to the cliff. I had not gone far on this trail that the wild dogs used when I saw the broken shaft of an arrow. It had been gnawed off near the tip, and I knew it was from the arrow which had wounded the leader. Further on, I saw his tracks in the dust. They were uneven, as if he were traveling slowly. I followed them toward the cliff, but finally lost them in the darkness. The next, the next day and the next it rained, and I did not go look for him. I spent those days making more arrows, and on the third day, with those arrows in my spear, I went out along the trail the wild dogs had made to and from my house. There were no tracks after the rain, but I followed the trail to the pile of rocks where I had seen them before. On the far side of the rocks, I found the big gray dog. He had the broken arrow in his chest and he was lying with one of his legs under him. 
He was about ten paces from me, so I could see him clearly. I was sure that he was dead, but I lifted the spear and took a good look at him. Just as I was about to throw the spear, he raised his head a little from the earth and then let it drop. This surprised me greatly, and I stood there for a while not knowing what to do, whether to use the spear or my bow. I was used to animals playing dead until they suddenly turned on you or ran away. The spear was the better of the two weapons at this distance, but I could not use it as well as the other. So I climbed onto the rocks where I could see him if he ran. I placed my feet carefully. I had a second arrow ready should I need it. I fitted an arrow and pulled back the string aiming at his head. Why I did not send the arrow, I cannot say. I stood on the rock with the bow pulled back and my hand would not let it go. The big dog lay there and did not move and this may be the reason. If he had gotten up, I would have killed him. I stood there for a long time looking down at him and then I climbed off the rocks. He did not move when I went up to him, nor could I see him breathing until I was very close. The head of the arrow was still in his chest and the broken shaft was covered with blood. The thick fur around his neck was matted from the rain. I did not think that he knew I was picking him up for his body was limp as if he were dead. He was very heavy and the only way I could lift him was by kneeling and putting his legs around my shoulders. In this manner, stopping to rest when I was tired, I carried him to the headland. I could not get through the opening under the fence, so I cut the bindings and lifted out two of the will ribs and thus took him into the house. He did not look at me or raise his head when I laid him on the floor, but his mouth was open and he was breathing. The arrow had a small point, which was fortunate, and came out easily, though it had gone deep. He did not move while I did this, nor afterwards as I cleaned the wound with the peeled stick from the coral bush. This bush has poisonous berries, yet its wood often heals the wounds that nothing else will. I had not gathered food for many days, and the baskets were empty, so I left water for the dog, and after mending the fence, went down to the sea. I had no thought that he would live, and I did not care. All day I was among the rocks gathering shellfish, and only once did I think of the wounded dog, my enemy, lying there in the house, and then to wonder why I had not killed him. So before I read on, let's think about that a minute. Think about your own reasons. I would love to have a discussion right now. But you have to think, you know, she's by herself. These dogs are hunting her. They will kill her and eat her. Uh, they did kill her brother. So you would have a lot of um, revenge feelings. Um, but also, these dogs are the other living things on the island. Um, so I want you to think about, why do you think Karana wasn't able to kill that dog that had killed her brother? And what do you think her plan will be? I know it's sometimes hard for me reading this. We think of our dogs as pets, but you have to remember, these are wild dogs loose on the island, and wild dogs are, are mean. They hunt like a wolf. So it is a danger to people. But it's also a cute dog, so you know you can understand her position a bit. He was still alive when I got back, though he had not moved from the place where I had left him. Again, I cleaned the wound with a coral twig. I then lifted his head and put water in his mouth, which he swallowed. This was the first time that he had looked at me since the time I'd found him on the trail. His eyes were sunken and they looked out at me from far back in his head. Before I went to sleep, I gave him more water. In the morning, I left food for him when I went down to the sea. And when I came home, he had eaten it. He was lying in the corner watching me. While I made a fire and cooked my supper, he watched me. His yellow eyes followed me wherever I moved. That night I slept on the rock, for I was afraid of him. And at dawn, as I went out, I left the hole under the fence open so he could go. But he was there when I got back, lying in the sun with his head on his paws. I had speared two fish, which I cooked for my supper. Since he was very thin, I gave him one of them, and after he had eaten it, he came over and lay down by the fire, watching me with his yellow eyes that were very narrow and slanted up at the corners. Four nights I slept on the rock, and every morning I left the hole under the fence open so he could leave. Each day I speared a fish for him, and when I got home, he was always at the fence waiting for it. He would not take the fish from me, so I had to put it on the ground. Once I held out my hand to him, but at this he backed away and showed his teeth. On the fourth day, when I came back from the rocks early, he was not there at the fence waiting. A strange feeling came over me. Always before when I had returned, I had hoped that he would be gone. But now as I crawled under the fence, I did not feel the same. I called out, Dog! Dog! for I had no other name for him. I ran toward the house, calling it. He was inside. He was just getting to his feet, stretching himself and yawning. 
He looked first at the fish I carried and then at me and moved his tail. That night I stayed in the house. Before I fell asleep, I thought of a name for him, for I could not call him Dog. The name I thought of was Rontu, which means in our language, fox eyes. All right, so now she's got a friend. We'll see how it works out. We'll read one more chapter. The white men's ship did not return that spring or in the summer. But every day, whether I was on the headland or gathering shellfish on the rocks or working on my canoe, I watched for it. I also watched for the red ship of the Aleuts. I was not sure what I would do if the Aleuts came. I could hide in the cave which I had stored with food and water, for it was surrounded by thick brush and the mouth of the ravine could only be reached from the sea. The Aleuts had not used the spring and did not know about it because there was another one closer to where they had camped. But they might come upon the cave by chance and then I must be ready to flee. For this reason, I worked on the canoe I had abandoned on the spit. I went to the place where the others were hidden, but they were dried out and cracked. Also, they were too heavy for a girl to push into the water, even a girl as strong as I was. The tides had almost buried the canoe, and I was, and I, I'm sorry, my, uh, it's hard to read this part. And I labored many days to dig it out of the sand. Since the weather was warm, I did not go back and forth to my house on the headland but cooked my meals on the sand spit and at night slept in the canoe, which saved much time. Even this canoe was too big for me to pull easily in and out of the water, so I set about making it smaller. I did this by loosening all the planks, by cutting the sinews and heating the pitch that bound them together. I then shaped these planks to half their length using sharp knives made from a black stone, which is to be found at one place on the island, and bound them back together with fresh pitch and sinews. The canoe when I had finished was not so beautiful as it had been before, but I could now lift one end of it and drag it through the waves. All the time I was working on the canoe, which was most of that summer, Ron too was with me. He was either sleeping in the shade of the canoe or running up and down the sand spit chasing the pelicans that roost there in great numbers because there are numerous fish nearby. He never caught any of the birds, yet he would keep trying until his tongue had hung out of his mouth. He had learned his name quickly and many words that meant something to him. Zolwit, for example, which is our word for pelican, and naip, which means fish. I talked to him often, using these words and others, and many that he did not understand, just as though I were talking to one of my people. Rantu, I would say, after he had stolen a special fish I had speared for my supper, tell me why it is you that it, tell me why it is that you are such a handsome dog and yet such a thief. He would put his head on one side and then the other, although he knew only the two words, and looked at me. Or I would say, it is a beautiful day. I have never seen the ocean so calm and the sky looks like a blue shell. How long do you think these days will last? Ron too would look up at me just the same, though he understood none of these words, acting as if he did. Because of this, I was not lonely. I did not know how lonely I had been until I had Ron too to talk to. When the canoe was finished and the pitch had dried, I wanted to find out if it went through the water and if the planks leaked. So we set off on a long voyage around the island. The voyage took all of one day, from dawn until night. There are many sea caves on the island of the Blue Dolphins, and some of them are large and go far back into the cliffs. One of these was near the headland where my house stood. The opening was narrow, not much wider than the canoe, but once we were inside, it spread out and was larger than my place on the headland. The walls were black and smooth and slanted far up over my head. The water was almost as black, except where light came through the opening. Here it was a gold color, and you could see fish swimming around. There were dip they were different from the fish on the reefs, having larger eyes and fins that drifted out of their bodies like kelp. This place opened into another, which was smaller and so dark I could see nothing. It was very silent in there, with no sound of the waves on the shore, and only lapping of the water against the rocky walls. I thought of the god Tumayoit, who had become angry at Mukat and gone down, down into another world, and I wondered if it were not to such a place as this that he had gone. Far ahead was a spot of light no larger than my hand, so instead of turning back, which I felt like doing, I drifted toward it around many turnings and came at last to another room much like the first. Along one side was a wide shelf rock, which ran out to the sea through a narrow opening. The tide was full, and yet the shelf was out of the water. It was a fine place to hide a canoe, which could be lifted out and stored there where no one could find it. The ledge joined the cliff just below my house. All I needed was a trail down to the cave and then the canoe would be close at hand. We have made a great discovery, I said to Rontu. 
Rontu did not hear me. He was watching a devil fish just beyond the opening of the cave. This fish has a small head with eyes that bulge and many arms. So think, what could that mean? A fish with many arms. All day, Rontu had been barking at the cormorants, the gulls, the seals, at everything that moved. Now that he was quiet, he was watching the black thing in the water. I let the canoe drift along and knelt down out of sight until I could pick up my spear. The devil fish was in front of us, swimming slowly near the surface, moving all its arms at once. Large devil fish are dangerous if you are in the sea, for their arms are as long as a man, and they can quickly wrap them around you. They also have a big mouth and a sharp beak where their arms join their head. This one was the largest I have ever seen. So, make your prediction. What's, uh, what is this fish? Hopefully you're thinking maybe an octopus. Since Rontu was standing in front of me and I could not put the canoe into a better position, I had to lean out to use the spear. As I did so, the devil fish saw my movements and let loose in the water a black cloud of liquid, which instantly hid him from view. I knew that the devil fish would not be in the center of this cloud that he had left behind. I therefore did not aim my spear at it, but picked up the paddle and waited until he appeared. He was now twice the length of the canoe from me, and though I paddled fast, I could not overtake him. Rontu, I said, for he was watching the black cloud in the water. You have much to learn about the devil fish. Rontu did not look at me or bark. He put his head to one side and then the other, still puzzled, more so when the cloud disappeared and nothing was left except clear water. Devil fish is the best food in the seas. The flesh is white and tender and very sweet but they are difficult to catch without a special kind of spear, which I now decided to make during the winter when I would have much time. I took the canoe to Coral Cove, not far from the cave, and pulled it up on the shore out of reach of the winter storms. There it would be safe until spring when I would hide it in the cave that Rontu and I had found. It was easy to paddle and did not leap. I was very happy. All right, and that is where we will stop for today. So I will see you soon. Keep checking back and looking for new videos. Uh, I'll probably get one posted early next week. All right, miss you all. Have a great day.